Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me. Hope you can see me. I have many monitors and many moving parts around here. Um, welcome to yet another webinar organized by EHPA, this time on the role of heat pumps in the green transition and the perspectives from different EU projects. Just a little bit of what will be happening today. So this is the agenda. Uh, a short introduction from me about the event, some housekeeping rules, then my colleague Josephine will come on and present you some very interesting numbers about the heat pump market. Um, afterwards, there'll be a, uh, some presentations related to projects such as uh, Reward Heat, because this, uh, this event is under the auspices of Reward Heat. Um, then we also have uh, reuse heat and Secretariat RHC, very nice projects that you will find out more about. Uh, then we will have a panel discussion. However, if during the presentations uh, you have a questions for a question for the speaker or speakers, uh, just use the chat function and and basically just tag the presenter you would like to to answer. So, for example, if you would like me to answer a question, just put at Dan or please Dan or just Dan coma something uh, and the question so we know uh, who the question is uh, directed towards. So uh, I will also ask my colleague to start the recording. So the recording of the event along with the slides that are presented will be made available to everyone that participates in this meeting uh, in about a few days time. So you'll get an email with everything. And if for some reason, you know, you in one year's time, you cannot find the recording, it's on the EHPA YouTube channel. It's very easy to, to find there using YouTube's uh, search bar. So with that being said, um, let me just tell you a little bit about the event. So as you know, the heat pump sector is, uh, to quote a famous American movie, very hot right now. Um, since the geopolitical shifts, as well as political shifts that were happening before, uh, the market, the interest, the focus on it um, are quite high and increasing each day, as you would see from me and my colleague Josephine that will, will come after me, uh, in the sense of the workload that we have, as well as the project projects and the policy um, policy aspects that are being done. Um, so we found it quite opportune to organize this event, um, especially under the auspices of Reward Heat, uh, because the project focuses on demonstrating um, uh, the next generation of low temperature district heating and cooling networks, uh, basically recovering waste heat and turning it into what we would like to call uh, circular heat or circular cold. Um, heat pumps, district heating, all the technologies that are basically uh, weighing us from fossil fuels and from our dependencies on other countries are basically the way forward and what what is happening right now uh, in the you know in our continent and probably in the world as well. Um, then there's also some uh, perspective from uh, other two projects. One is re reuse heat. Um, uh, it showcases models that can be replicated at, and can enable the recovery and reuse of excess heat available in the urban level. Again, quite important because a lot of a lot of energy is basically being wasted and could be used. Um, and then from a perspective from the Secretariat um, RHC, so the uh, European Technology and Innovation Platform on Renewable Heating and Cooling, which is basically a project bringing together several organizations in the field, including uh, EHPA, um, to basically uh, work on developing the next policy priorities for the sector. So with that being said, and sorry if I'm being very quick, but basically just to give more, uh, more time to our speakers, it is my pleasure to, let me see. Oh, I'm okay. So Josephine, I guess, already took control. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to, to my colleague Josephine, who has worked for four years at the Organization for Sustainable Energy, uh, the Flemish Heat Pump Association, which is a member of EHPA. Before that, she worked at Friends of the Supergrid, an EU association representing the electricity transmission sector. 
Um, she has a master's in international relations and diplomacy and a master's in German and Scandinavian linguistics and literature, which is very nice. And it's also very nice because she is our colleague, he, um, basically uh, leading the policy team. So she can tell you far more than me about policy, about the heat pump um, rollout and everything to do with the current work that she's doing and also the, the future and our priorities. So please, Josephine, the floor is yours. And if you have any trouble, just tell me and I will click next or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dan, for this very nice introduction. Um, also, maybe good to add that now. by now I'm almost three years uh, working uh, at EHBA, so um, thank you. As Dan said, I will give you a bit of a broader uh, political overview, first on the market numbers, then on the policies that are ongoing on heat pumps, and then I will shift also a bit the focus to large heat pumps, because that is what most of the projects that will be presented later uh, are focusing on. So, um, as you all know by now, uh, heat pumps are mature and they are used uh, everywhere today. Everyone has one in their house, in their fridge, um, but they're also uh, in commercial applications, residential applications, which are mostly under attention, I would have to say. But then also in industrial applications and district heating, on which we will focus more today, and also uh, in big buildings. As Dan already indicated, the, the sector is really hot or booming uh, right now. Um, as you can see, in 2022, there was really a remarkable growth of 38%. And by now, we have a stock of 19.9 million uh, installed heat pumps. Um, in 2022, there was uh, 3 million uh, additional heat pumps installed. So if you then zoom in on uh, some specific uh, countries, you see that the growth uh, is really uh, remarkable in some of them. Yeah, I put a bit too many in yellow, uh, but the main focus should be on, uh, for example, Czech Republic, where we had a growth of 99% last year. Then Poland, which is not uh, in yellow, but should be, where there was a growth of 101%. Uh, last year, and then also the Netherlands, where there was a growth of 80%. So you see that really, uh, yeah, also at national level, there's really spectacular growth numbers. But then even though there's a large growth, if we compare uh, the heating uh, heat pumps with uh, the boilers that are uh, sold, we still see that, yeah, the majority are still boilers. So last year, there were 7 million boilers sold and 2.7 million heating heat pumps. So before I said that there were 3 million heat pumps sold, but this is uh, both heating uh, heat pumps and uh, hot water heat pumps. And here we only focus on heating heat pumps. So there's still uh, some work to do, uh, so to say. Maybe also important to add in this context of these uh, large heat pump uh, projects that in our numbers, we primarily focus on residential heat pumps. We are trying to gather also a good overview of the market of industrial heat pumps and the stock installed and so on, but it's not so easy to get a clear overview there. But this is something we definitely want to have and we are working on together with our national associations and also the manufacturers of large uh, heat pumps. Now, I, there's a comment from someone who only sees the first page. I hope I am shifting the slides, uh, shifting the slides, and I see them moving. Yes, yes, you Maybe are. Maybe then no I will answer in the chat. Continue, please. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so today we have a stock of 17,800,000 uh, heating heat pumps. Again, the difference with this 19.9 million from the beginning is the hot water heat pumps. And this represents approximately a supply of 15% of all uh, buildings. Um, and yes, as you saw, this 38% uh, growth last year, this really shows that 2022 was a tipping point for heat pumps. And the reason for that, as of course, as you all know, unfortunately, was the invasion of uh, Russia into Ukraine, which made us all aware that heat pumps are not only good for uh, energy and climate targets, but also good to uh, for energy security and to reduce our reliance on uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels. This was picked up by the International Energy Agency, the IEA, um, and heat pumps got a, a very a large focus um, in their 10-point plan to reduce uh, the European Union's reliance on um, Russian natural gas. Not only the IEA picked this up, but also um, the 
European uh, Union wanted to react to European Commission, they published the Repower EU package, um, which was exactly a reaction to um, this, uh, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine and a reaction on how can we cut our dependence on Russian gas. And there, heat pumps really got a very clear focus, uh, very visibly, as you can see here on the picture. Uh, but also uh, in the report, mainly by adding clear targets for uh, the heat pump uh, development. The targets that were uh, added um, were focused on hydronic heat pumps. So the European Commission uh, wants to have 30 million additional hydronic heat pumps by 2030. And if we and extrapolate this number to the whole heat pump market because it's not only hydronic heat pumps uh, that will reduce our dependence on Russian gas, but also air to air heat pumps. And if we so if we extrapolate this to the whole this growth to the whole market, we arrive at 60 million additional heat pumps by 2030, which would mean actually a quadrupling of the current stock. So this is a very ambitious uh, growth. This is very ambitious numbers. Um, and to achieve that, our main conclusion is it's not enough to just put ambitious numbers. We also really need concerted action. We need a heat pump accelerator because you have, for example, a hydrogen accelerator, you have a wind, an offshore wind strategy, you have a solar power strategy. But if you put such a large focus on heat pumps, uh, then you also need to have a clear overview of how you want to achieve this large uh, scale rollout. So we are working together with a large group of stakeholders on this accelerator, including uh, the Commission and the different DGs, so DG Energy, DG Grow, DG Clima, DG Employment, uh, to look at where are the, still the different gaps, uh, what are still the different barriers to achieve this large scale heat pump rollout, and what should we do to overcome these barriers. And we are um, looking at five areas. So first of all, clean heating should be uh, the standard with long-term uh, policy uh, signals. We really need to make it very clear that the heating heat pumps are the technology, not only of the future, but of today. Um, so that not only citizens will know that this is uh, the way to go, but also investors and also, for example, manufacturers who are still manufacturer manufacturing both fossil fuel boilers and heat pumps. So they make also internally the shift completely to heat pumps because there is technology clarity. Then secondly, we need to uh, support also uh, production. Do we have increased production also uh, in Europe of heat pumps to achieve those targets? Of course, we need to invest uh, in grids um, and also in the flexibility. We also need to offer uh, to reward citizens for the flexibility that they can offer uh, to the grid by using a heat pump. Uh, then, of course, very important is to de develop an enabling framework for consumers. So also the business case needs to make sense. For example, taxes on the electricity bill are in many countries still higher than the taxes and levies on the fossil fuel bill, and there uh, a shift is needed. Also, the, the investment cost of a heat pump is still higher than of fossil fuel boilers there. Uh, very specifically, the low-income households should be supported, so um, all these things should be taken into account. And then lastly, of course, of course, the skills and the workforce um, are needed to achieve this large scale rollout. So there we need to see how we can yeah, exchange best practices between countries, how we can um, incentivize people to join this sector or to reskill uh, to work in the heat pump sector. So this is something that we are currently working on. And the Commission is also internally working on a heat pump action plan, also based on these points. And this will be uh, published by the end of the year. Um, now I will focus a bit more on large heat pumps because that's the main focus also of the projects uh, that will uh, be presented later today. Um, so, of course, uh, large heat pumps, uh, industrial heat pumps here on the left, you see the different sources that they can use. Yeah, then the heat pump uh, process, the cycle and the different applications. So uh, large heat pumps are usually um, used in, in drying processes such as paper and pulp, wood, fruits, vegetables. Uh, but also in the in the food industry, so dairy and breweries, 
and so on. And then, of course, also um, in district heating, uh, as you can see here. So the standard temperature for district heating is around 90 degrees. And then the more industrial applications, that be that's between 120 and 160 degrees today. But there is a lot of re research and development ongoing to reach higher temperatures. And maybe uh, also the projects today uh, are maybe also looking at that, that I'm not sure. So uh, we will see later. Of course, um, heat pumps in industrial applications and district heatings and district uh, heating systems, um, yeah, the ideal um, ways uh, to use them is when you have renewable energy available and when you have waste heat available, because then you can really close uh, the energy cycle and this waste heat is no longer wasted, but uh, it's reused um, and it's actually yeah, excess heat and not uh, waste heat. Also, uh, there's a lot of potential to increase um, industrial heat pumps in uh, Europe. So this is from the IEA report on uh, the future um, of heat pumps. And you see that 37% um, of all industrial heat um, is below 200 degrees. So this is what we call a heat pumpable. <laughs> um, so if we want to transform all this industrial heat uh, into uh, heat pumps, um, yeah, that would be possible. It's around 105 uh, gigawatt, but then we would have to install 300 megawatts of industrial heat pumps um, every month until 2050. So we see there's really, really a huge potential and there's really a lot of a lot more attention needed also on these industrial heat pumps. On the what I presented before, this heat pump accelerator, we, we we are covering mostly, yeah, in general heat pumps, but you see that, for example, the prices and consumers and so on, it's still mostly um, directed on residential heat pumps. So it's definitely needed to also put a specific focus on large heat pumps, on district heating and so on. Um, and very important in this regard is also this report that was published a few weeks ago by Danfoss, one of our members, and where they say that um, actually the world's largest untapped energy source is excess heat. And here again, you see that they don't call it waste heat, but excess heat. So also to shift the mind that this heat, it's not wasted, it's really excess heat that should be used. Um, and in this report, they also have an overview, they have a map um, of the excess heat potential of selected cities in the EU. And they give some clear policy recommendations, for example, that it's really needed to regulate this uh, and that excess heat should really consider, be considered as an important energy source and that this should also be uh, included in legislation. For example, making it mandatory for industries, for data centers to uh, make a plan what to do with this uh, excess heat so that this is not uh, being wasted. Um, another important aspect is that economic incentives should be addressed. How can we make a good business case out of this? And thirdly, of course, that partnerships should be uh, established between the, the providers of this excess heat, the ones who could use it, but also um, the, the infrastructure that is needed uh, to connect both of them. Um, so yeah, this is definitely, I think, a topic that will get more and more attention now that heat pumps are booming. And yes, we are really focused on this residential heat pump, but it should also shift to, look, to unlock this excess heat. And for example, now, um, both EHPA, but many other organizations are also looking into um, proposing what should be the some important aspects that the next uh, commission uh, should take up in the next legislature. And this uh, could be one of these examples to put really this focus on excess heat and also on large heat pumps. Uh, then thank you very much. And then I yeah, let then take back the control. Thank you so much, Josephine. And there's a lot of work being done by the by the policy team, as you see. Um, I think something to really keep in mind is this heat pump accelerator as the be all and almost end all of of current current affairs. So if you have any questions, please uh, refer them to our policy team. And also, if you like those numbers about heat pumps and their growth, uh, keep in mind that the market report of EHPA should be out soon and it's usually going to be unveiled with an event. So I don't know, keep a lookout on social media and on our website for, for that particular one. So with that being said, um, I invite to the virtual floor, 
um, Roberto Fedrizzi, Research Group Leader at the Institute for Renewable Energy at EURAC Research. Uh, Roberto has been coordinating the Sustainable Heating and Cooling Research Group at EURAC Research since 2009. The focus of the research team is on the design and expert control of heat pump driven thermal plants in single buildings and in district heating applications. Roberto coordinates and participates in several Horizon 2020 funded projects, among which the project Reward Heat, which I have a little suspicion that he will speak about today. So, Roberto, I hope you have control of the slides. If not, uh, please just press the button. Yes. And if there's any problem, just tell me next and I will take back control and I will change the slides for you. So the virtual floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and thank you for the introduction. Morning, everybody. Hopefully you see the presentation properly. Moving to the next slide. You should see the, the uh, yes. title now, if uh, everything was correctly. So yeah, um, as Dan said, my presentation today will be an introduction to the rewarded uh, project with a focus on uh, on the role of the heat pumps in uh, in uh, in this project. The rewarded project is about uh, district heating and cooling networks, and uh, in particular on how to uh, optimize or maximize possibly the utilization of waste heat or excess heat, as uh, Josephine said, in, uh, um, in district heating and on the other end on how to um, yeah, uh, integrate as much as possible renewable energy sources into that. Our focus in the project is in particular on low temperature waste heat and renewables. And this is because um, not only um, we get wasted from uh, from industrial processes, but from an, uh, a number of um, applications and, and contests in the in the uh, urban texture in the uh, urban uh, context itself. So again, we can uh, get wasted uh, also from air conditioners, from uh, refrigeration systems in supermarket, and also from other tertiary buildings like banks and 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 others where data centers are, are uh, placed. Uh, on the other end, uh, we also have a lot of renewable energy, which is uh, flowing uh, next to us in rivers and on seashores and lakes, uh, lake uh, shores. Uh, so again, we uh, our vision is that we should somehow make use of this low temperature energy that is available where we live <clears throat> instead of, of um, importing energy on site. And let me see if I can last point. Yeah. Um, and if we go a little more in the details, uh, the vision of the project is that, uh, again, we should uh, make use um, um, as much as possible of low temperature renewable energies which are available, we should somehow try to close the energy, uh, the energy loop by reusing waste energy in a circular energy approach. And as you might understand, <clears throat> since uh, um, since we uh, since the temperature is low, there is large um, a chance for heat pumps to enter into play and to play a big role in the in the game. Um, in fact, the idea is that we should reuse or make available this energy, this low temperature energy, with importing as, as low as possible energy from outside the, 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 the context, the, the urban context. And to do that, um, we need to, to play with um, balancing out heating and cooling loads and heating and cooling uh, production. For this reason, again, or in this context, uh, again, the, the, the heat pump can, can play a key role. Indeed, uh, digitalization is needed uh, because uh, monitoring and controlling the availability and the needs of uh, thermal loads or thermal energy in the different parts of the, of the, um, of the town or the, of the, of the city, which is covered by, by district heating, is uh, now a challenge compared to providing energy from a central uh, heating point. And finally, again, uh, as you will see uh, this morning, 
uh, there is also need um, uh, to develop dedicated business models and financing schemes that are helping with integrating this um, um, distributed energy availability. Um, as I said, the uh, the the heat pump here uh, or heat pumps here play a, a central role uh, to um, exchange energy with the uh, with the grid or with the thermal with the thermal uh, network in in both directions because the the, the wasted or the, the renewable energy can be uh, available at lower temperature than the supply of the network itself. And still, again, because uh, the supply temperature from the district heating can be lower than uh, the user uh, needs. So again, when we started a few years ago looking into how to use heat pumps um, for, for in this kind of networks, uh, we started from a, a scheme, which is the one that you see on the left side of the slide, and um, which is a, a quite conventional one uh, coming from, say, geothermal geothermal systems. <clears throat> and that can be used in, in both ways. So to recover heat in the network and to uh, take uh, heat from the, and to draw from, from the grid uh, to the user. Soon, however, uh, what happened is that we understood that this is not really the uh, optimal way of using heat pumps in this context because of two main reasons. On the one hand, if you use uh, geothermal or water heat pumps, conventional water heat pumps for this, uh, for this purpose, it might be that you are, uh, again, wasting exergy from, from the network because you might uh, have a supply temperature which is in the range of 40, 50 degrees, and then the water heat pump only accepts something like 20, 25 at the evaporator. So you need to temper the, te the temp you, you need to use a tempering valve to reduce the um, supply temperature to the evaporator of the heat pump, which is not really uh, the best way of using your, your energy. Um, the, the same, uh, you, you might understand it, uh, the same problem you might understand it if you want to recover waste heat, which is av uh, available from a process at again 40, 50 degrees. Um, and then again, you need to reduce the temperature to the heat pump before you can use it with your, with your uh, solution. On the other hand, it might well be um, that um, the user, the supply temperature, to the, to the user varies along the day. So um, again, using a configuration like this one, in which you need to go through the heat pump uh, for, uh, for your, uh, um, uh, to recover, to draw waste, uh, to draw energy from the, from the grid, from the network to the user, uh, is not the, the optimal one. So through the project rewarded, what we are doing now is to really go into the details of how you want to optimize the use um, of the heat pumps into dedicated substations that go beyond the, the, uh, the basic or the conventional, the most obvious way of integrating these, these components. And what we are doing, for example, with uh, one large utility company in, uh, in Europe, is to look for industrialized uh, substations that are using uh, heat pumps both for covering or for covering at the same time heating and cooling loads uh, at the, uh, in, the, in the single building. <clears throat> Again, uh, here in the conceptual scheme that you see on the right side, you see that we, uh, they are using um, um, say the evaporator for covering cooling loads and they are transferring heat to the heat loads with the same with the same heat pump. Again, this is a very conceptual one. The, the schematic is very, uh, the PNID of the real system is much more complicated than this with heat pumps that can be placed in uh, parallel uh, or in series one to another in order to facilitate the modulation of the, of the thermal capacity of the system. Um, the uh, advantage of this solution is, uh, again, that 
um, you can use, they can use conventional heat pumps uh, for, for the system because the temperature uh, levels that are, um, that are um, yeah, um, available at the evaporator and condenser of the heat pump are the, the, the ones that normally uh, are uh, happening um, in, in conventional systems that we see in single buildings. Uh, the other advantage is that by covering both uh, heating and cooling loads with the same uh, with the same heat pumps, they can uh, decrease or limit the amount of uh, heating or cooling capacity and, uh, and cooling capacity actually that is installed. Therefore, again, they can reduce really much the investment, the uh, uh, capex that is uh, used for the uh, for installing the uh, the substation. Indeed, uh, on the other end, the uh, control of the heat pump system of the substation system is a challenge because you need to somehow uh, try to uh, you, you need to uh, balance out heating and cooling loads if they are available uh, uh, on site, and you need to minimize the energy import uh, from from the from the network to to balance out heating and cooling. So this requires, on the one hand, smart controls to be implemented. On the other hand, uh, they, uh, this requires also to use uh, thermal storage capacity installed on site to balance out as much as possible. Indeed, uh, it is not possible to balance out everything, and that is why the system is connected to, to, the, um, to the network. Uh, the overall network Controls, uh, controls all the substations in the different buildings in a way to not only balance the loads on site, but also balance out the loads among buildings and therefore again minimize the um, need for electricity and for um, yeah, uh, backup units to, to be used and central storage also to be used. Um, this is uh, um, a solution that fits with uh, um, tertiary buildings most of the time because there you have um, both in winter and summer uh, heating and cooling loads that somehow happen. Uh, this is not always the case um, in, in all applications uh, where, uh, where uh, district heating and cooling uh, can pass by. So uh, we are also developing together with another uh, with a with a manufacturer, actually Danfoss, uh, a solution in which we, uh, which is a prefabricated substation in which we are trying to use uh, heat pumps at best. And again, in the initial um, in the initial uh, schematic that I've uh, shown, you've seen this kind of configuration uh, in which you have on the left side the district heating that is providing energy to the heat pump. And again, on the condenser side of the heat pump, then you have the loads, including eventually storage and, and everything. This is very uh, simplified schematic of how the heat pump is, is used. Again, what we learned is that this is not really the, or not all, um, in all cases, the best configuration for using, or the best uh, solution for using a heat pump. Um, because it might be that the supply temperature uh, um, from the from the district heating reaches 40, 50 degrees. And then on the one hand, you want to use a heat pump that is dedicated. It's not a, a conventional water heat pump. Rather, it is maybe an industrial uh, unit which accepts high temperature to the evaporator. On the other hand, it might be that if the return temperature from the load, so the yellow, the yellow um, branch uh, has a lower temperature compared to the supply from the, from the district heating, you might want to uh, move from a direct conventional flow uh, configuration to a split flow configuration in which you use water from, uh, from the district heating both at the evaporator and the condenser side. In this way, you can uh, increase the COP of the of the substation, the the, the uh, overall substation COP or equivalent COP, by uh, quite a lot. 
and um, again in, in this way optimize the use uh, uh, the use uh, of the of the energy from the district heating and minimize the electricity used at customer side or um, on the other end, it might be that uh, again the uh, temperature from the from the district heating is uh, higher uh, once more than what is accepted by the, the evaporator, and then this split flow configuration is not useful anymore. And you might want to go for um, for another kind of configuration, which gives again very high COPs of the subsystem of the substation overall, and you use. In a, in a reverse flow configuration, the energy or the flow from the, from the district heating at the condenser in, uh, um, inlet while you use the return from the user at the evaporator inlet. This again provides you with very high uh, COPs overall with another advantage for the, um, for the district heating, which is to minimize return flow uh, to, the, to the main pipeline which is again for those who uh, are used to, to men or to, to work in district heating, a very desirable uh, feature for managing the, the network itself. Um, this configuration, uh, as you see it in the slides, is for, for heating purposes. So you have, uh, again, district heating on the left side and, and the user on the, on the right side, but you can reverse it very easily and imagine that you have a, a wasted source on the left side, like a data center or a refrigeration system, as I said before, and you have the district heating on the on the right side. Um, so again, really in a very simplified way, uh, what we are trying to do in uh, in uh, in, uh, in rewarded with uh, with respect to heat pumps, as I said before. Um, the uh, or or as you might understand also from from the from the few schemes that you are seeing on the slides, um, managing these uh, different schemes and def different systems is kind of a challenge. On the one hand, because you want to <clears throat> uh, use storage to cover um, different uh, different loads over over the day. Uh, for example, domestic or water um, and, and space heating or space cooling during the day. On the other end, you want to balance out heating and cooling loads. So you might want to use different storage solutions at local level in the substation, for example. You want to use intraday storages, for example, using the capacity in the in the uh, in the pipes of the of the network itself for storing energy uh, during uh, during different hours of the day. But you want to also use uh, seasonal, you might want to use seasonal uh, storage to uh, balance out eating and cooling loads across the across the season. So again, uh, next to developing substations that are dedicated to uh, to district eating applications, eating and cooling applications, we're also trying to understand how to optimize the use of different uh, kind of storages in different sizes and different locations uh, along the network. And finally, obviously, the next point is uh, how to use all these units in an optimal way. Uh, not only the heat pumps in the substations, but also the, the storage uh, capacity that you have distributed along the network. And for this, we are developing also uh, platforms uh, to uh, access energy data in real time, which is uh, we use MAR metering to uh, get uh, flows, um, temperatures, delta T's, and, uh, and energy flows um, across the substation or in the substation along the, along the network. We're using data mining uh, procedures, data mining algorithms to analyze the data and to uh, gather performance of the single units and, the, uh, and to assess uh, performance of the single units and of the network itself. And then we are developing full detection and control uh, strategies for optimizing the utilization of the sources that we have available on site, renewables, and, uh, and waste it on the one end, and to balance out optimally heating and cooling loads 
I don't want to enter too much into this because Christian next in, in, the, in the next presentation will go really much deeper uh, in, uh, in the topic. Um, just to conclude with the final slide, uh, it is not when it comes to these kind of applications, it is not only a matter of developing technologies. It is also a matter of making utilities um, in the um, in uh, or allowing utilities to use these applications and to plan the uh, the uh, development of a district heating and cooling networks in a proper way. So in rewarded, what we are doing also is to uh, develop planning schemes and performance database bases uh, for these kind of uh, substations that I've shown. In, uh, in, in the previous slides, and we are uh, developing pre-designed tools that are uh, allowing to easily calculate how much energy you can get from, uh, and, and to what price, to what cost, you can get from uh, uh, one or the other sources, and how they should somehow optimally integrate it into, a, into a, an energy grid. Um, yeah, that was me. Hopefully, it was I was not too too long. I will leave it to to Christian because uh, his presentation is really interesting, in my opinion, and in entering into the topic. Thank you so much, Roberto, uh, and thank you for going into detail on the different designs that you had there. That was that was quite quite interesting, especially the valorization using the map and all the resources that are available. That well, most people are not really uh, aware of. Uh, so, uh, thank you again, Roberto. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Christian Kane, Project Manager at EDF Mediterranean Regional Trade Direction. Uh, Christian is a Project Manager um, for the Trade Direction of EDF in Marseille. He's responsible for different innovative and collaborative projects with EDF, uh, turned towards decarbonization, the uh, decentralization and digitalization. Um, he has the chance he had the chance to work in Germany, China and France on different topics related to the smart and sustainable cities and districts. Um, uh, such as um, stationary battery storage systems, uh, flexibility and system services or smart charging, among many, many others, I assume. Um, so thank you so much, Christian, for being here today. Uh, if you could press the button with take control. Yeah. And I hope it works. Um, the virtual floor and microphone is yours. Thank you very much then for the introduction. Um, let's see if it works. Yes, so um, I'm presenting a common work that we're doing in the framework of the Reward Heat project. Um, so we're working on together with EDF and Dalkia on this project. Dalkia is a 100% subsidiary of EDF and it's actually our uh, leading uh, company for all energy services, uh, which we also integrate inside the notion of district heating and cooling. So I will present one of the demonstrator that we have in Reward Heat. Um, it's the low temperature uh, district heating and cooling network of La Saint-sur-Mer. Uh, La Saint-sur-Mer is in the south of France, um, which is very peculiar for us in the terms of uh, district heating market because what has to be understood is in the south, in the southern part of Europe, uh, like on the Mediterranean coast in France, um, district heating is not just about heating, but the equation really needs also cooling. Uh, we need cooling to have enough heat in degree hours or cooling degree hours during the year to be able to have enough volume of energy uh, to produce to justify this type of networks. So we need also in this type of networks always, um, let's say one or several uh, big uh, cooling demands, usually presented by tertiary offices or commercial buildings, as we have in this case. Um, so going back to this district heating cooling network, it was gained. It was an existing one um, developed by the by the local authority, and they sent out a call for tender in 2017, which has been taken by Dalkia, uh, which gave them a public de public delegation of service contract for 20 years for exploitation of the network that I will just present to you next. So uh, as I said, it's a low temperature district heating and cooling. Um, could be also said as a neutral temperature district heating and cooling because we are using a source, um, the seawater uh, from the port, which is between 8 and 25 degrees between uh, winter and summer. 
So as you see in the scheme, um, we pump this water from four meter depth in a first loop, which is our seawater loop, uh, which brings this um, neutral water, uh, seawater, salty water towards a pumping station where we exchange it directly um, through a heat exchanger, plate heat exchanger, and pump it back directly to the sea. And so we have the second step of the network, which is actually a low temperature loop, which brings uh, through cleansed water, uh, the calories uh, between the seawater loop and uh, the different substations, which are at the building level. So we have the energy production is at the building level. So we have heat pumps, different configurations. Uh, we might have just heating heat pumps. We might heating and cooling, so reversible heat pump or thermorefrigerant thermo heat pumps, so that we can produce either heating and or cooling. Um, so here you see the network as we took it over in 2017. Uh, you see on the top of the figure, and one is where we have. Uh, let's see if. The the point of work is where we have the pumping station and then we had the first uh, network which was about five customers um, until 2017. So I put you the figure of the pumping station as you might see you don't see it because it's underground and what I put you on the right are the seawater filters uh, in this station just to develop a little bit uh, notion of dimension so it's not really a huge installation. Um, I also put you the photos on the second part of the substations um, in the substation of the casino, which is the big, biggest custom on the network. And you see um, the thermal refrigerating pump that we have there. Each of one is about 100 kilowatts of power um, per dimension. So um, what you see here on the right is the extension of the network. This was the original part we took over. And uh, during the contract, we extended and the project we extended by other three kilometers of piping. Uh, the network. Um, this was the plan. What you see on the map is the plan, the original plan of extension. But I put you a little sign of stop, of halt, because actually in France um, you have no real obligation of connection. It's uh, it's a commercial uh, engagement of the operator to be able to make a better economic and environmental offer to a customer, but the customer is not obliged uh, to connect to this uh, to this network. So the discussion and uh, the connection with this customer has been postponed. Um, like the current situation does enable them to go further. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the network is expanded, and I will present you what we put into the scope of the project of rework heat. So we have our system as it works today with the seawater loop, um, the, uh, the the neutral the. Um, the low temperature loop and then a different substation at the building level. These are today uh, all uh, operated by the SCADA system. And what we will add is an additional, uh, let's say, smarter system in which we have forecast and optimization uh, functionalities that we'll present a little bit more in the next part. Uh, second point for us would be uh, also to use the network as a storage, which is not completely correct. So today we are able to operate to, to separate uh, the seawater loop and the, the, the low temperature loop one from the other. And so the low temperature loop can work uh, independently from the seawater loop in a temperature range between 12 and 24 degrees. So it means that all heating and cooling loads between the different customers can balance out uh, between each other. And so we don't need an additional source uh, for heating or cooling these buildings. It's just the connection between the, the loop and them that makes possible to not use an energy source, a balancing source, um, to operate it. And the third part, it's an energy performance contracting that we implement with the casino customer because his cooling needs are really important for us because they provide excess heat um, into the network that can be used uh, by the other customers and so ameliorate the COP behind uh, of the substations. And so we made an, an extensive work to understand how we could make a dynamic retribution for these calories that are used by the net to another customers and so provide a kind of uh, retribution for this prosumer. Uh, nevertheless, we have seen that it's very complicated to uh, have a clear methodology for that. So we opted to um, condense the information and the calculation and estimation that we have done uh, in the project and provide him a retribution, a fixed retribution that we integrated in the fixed fee, uh, connection fee to the network. And so he has a retribution every month for the energy that we harvest uh, thanks to him. 
So what is this platform that you integrated it? It's uh, the mix. It's called the mix. It's Dutch Energy Mix. It's a platform that has been developed by DFRND. It's really a platform that would like to have uh, to, to accompany district heating cooling networks on all the life cycle. So we have a first part that we call the mix conception. So it's a part of the mix which is used uh, for sizing uh, um, sizing district heating cooling networks. So it's a part of the, the tool that enters in the design phase. And then the most important part we are focusing on this work, it's the mix conduit, so uh, the mix as operation. Um, so it integrates the notion of load forecast uh, for optimizing the operation and globally rise performances might then be economical or uh, environmental for the network. And clearly once we have such, uh, let's say an overarching platform, uh, the upper value should be that of creating um, a repository for all this project where can be used to share an experience, models, data, and uh, let's say feedback of the different installation have been realized. Um, here you see an interface uh, of the classical uh, tool as it's done today. So it's the dashboard that you have. You will integrate it integrates um, metering data, so hypervision, uh, with uh, forecast also information, and then the operator can choose to implement or not the um, dispatching plan that is uh, generated uh, by the tool. Um, what has to be said is by today, uh, these functionalities are working in terms of power. So it's a power forecast and also um, power optimization. And what we will do with these projects to go deeper into the optimization, uh, not a centralized one in terms of power, but one in a decentralized one. So to know, have the forecast of temperature, set temperature and flows in each and every part of the network. So for that, we need uh, a clearer vision in terms of forecast. Today's forecast is working in a centralized manner. It's used for district classical the central district heating and cooling. Uh, we operate at the, uh, the generation station, um, the system. Nevertheless, here we are the centralized one. So also the forecast has to be decentralized. So we have to be able to forecast each and every substation, uh, the loads, and not only for the whole network. So this was one challenge that we took over. Um, what we use for that is an in-house tool that de de developed by DF is called Forecast Heat, um, which uses different learning algorithms. So it's based on historical data that we use better one, let's see, two years of historic data, which we need to train this model. And then it creates um, a forecast model for each and every substation in terms of heating and cooling. Um, one part that was interesting in that work was the, the part about cooling. Um, indeed, uh, our biggest cooling customer is the casino. Uh, we have seen that the correlation of cooling is not temperatures, but is mostly the usage and the affluence of the net of the casino, which is based on two areas. Uh, one is the playing game area, let's say, uh, where we had uh, where we have uh, several slot machines, and the second part is an event uh, area where we have different um, different events, and so there to know the affluence of the two sites is the biggest. Uh, so the occupancy rate, huh, actually, of the of the casino, uh, is the main predictor. So we did a work of uh, calibrating, of uh, exploring um, the capacities of the tool to uh, make forecasts of this occupancy rate. So we have uh, retrieved several years of affluence of the network, uh, of the network, of the of the site, of the casino, and we have seen that with terms of calendar information like days of the week, the months, the season, we already have a very good um, uh, a very good forecast of this of this uh, behavior. So. Um, we also have seen, we have also explored many other variables like wind, insulation, others, but we have seen they have no meaningful amelioration in terms of uh, forecast. So we're still working uh, with the model in that way. The second challenge, uh, a part of the forecast and decentralize it uh, on each substation, have heating and cooling, as said, is the optimization. The optimization before, as said, was done in a centralized manner in terms of power. Um, and we have now to go down uh, for every section in the in this in the in the network, and so we have uh, flow rate uh, temperature optimization for the system. Uh, for that, we use also a system that developed in EDF. It's called Clavery. It's an optimized planning software. And what we did in special for this system is to couple on one side, as you see on the left, on the right side, a technical, so um, 
uh, a physical model of the network together with an optimization module. So they will iterate uh, one with the other continuously until they get the right set and the convergence of the optimization. And so the communication between an optimization and a physical model um, that we integrated. Um, we go further. So for this, until now, we were using linear. Uh, optimization, so multi integer linear programming um, softwares. And in the scope of the project, we enlarged the research for also comparing nonlinear uh, non uh, uh, solvers. And we have stressed out more or less the pros and the cons for each of the two systems. We finally have opted for uh, the nonlinear optimization because has to understood that our modeling is not a linear modeling like in Java or other languages. We are using Modelica, so Dimola. So we have uh, the description of the systems through the physical equations. So using nonlinear uh, uh, solvers can um, avoid us to have to linearize uh, all the system. Um, the efficiency of the simulation is totally acceptable. We have less than a minute for a 24 hour forecast. And as we are sending out uh, all this every half an hour, this is totally fine. Um, we are a little bit an issue uh, concerning the, op the, the choice of the, of, the, of the optimal solution because we have uh, local minima problems. So each and every substation might have a, a lock in and, 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 a, and a local minima and a local, local optima, which doesn't correspond to the overall uh, optima of the system. But we can have that uh, solved by multiple starts up and uh, generation of different parameters for the system. So um, we have a lot of experience with uh, linear programming, but well, uh, we use this project to also gain, um, to take the challenge and integrate nonlinear solvers and uh, work with them. So uh, coming to the end, um, we implemented so the system. So we have on the right side, we have our uh, district heating and cooling network on site with our uh, WIT uh, SCADA system. Um, so we have one main substation, which is the main controller for all the other uh, parts of the system, which are all on premise. And we connected this uh, with, the, with uh, the DEMIC software, which is working on the cloud together and be able to exchange information. Basically, uh, the system sends out every 30 minutes all meter data. Uh, we optimize them and send back the configuration data. And then it's the system itself, so the local SCADA, which has to ensure the consistency of um, the generated operation plan and implement it or not. Um, just to show you then uh, the work behind. So we have uh, the system, the main substation where we are working on with our colleagues from Dalkin and the FRD and the different automated system we developed behind. So uh, last slide. So um, we have already set the system operational since end of last year. Um, so we are currently debugging the software and ensure everything is safe, operation is safe and secure, they're exchanging the right data and the right orders. And we are yet not implementing the orders when they come in. We will have a uh, next post evaluation um, in a few in a couple of months. And then decide if we go online with the system for the full cooling and heating season for 2023-2024. And then just a few few takeaways, I think sometimes we have done extensive work for forecast, we have been challenged on that. And I think before challenging forecast and see if we are now can improve it from 20 to 15 or for 5 to 10 percent currency, I think I should have done extensive work before of that of all securing the metering uh, chain of a system and ensure that well we have reliable calibration of the meters because um, Many, many, uh, many um, unforeseen things on the side. Um, also, one feedback that we have the system is very small. Um, we have uh, heat pumps which are in the range between 50 and 100 to 150 kilowatts. Um, so it's a rather small scale. And we have seen that mostly in the residential areas, we have really erratic behavior. We have really strong peaks and spikes, which sometimes they can be grasped by the model when they have a certain, let's say, uh, um, recurrent behavior. But sometimes they're very erratic. And so we really have um, a bigger challenge for certain type of substation to get uh, good forecasts and then clearly optimization. So one way that we used was that to bundle, bundle heat pumps, bundle uh, substation, which we can ag aggregate and so a little bit phase out uh, the spikes. Um, and well, and I think also that sometimes it's not, uh, I don't hear 
hear that very much, but I think it should be remembered that when we do optimization forecast, you should also integrate real life and the system doesn't uh, works always as it should. And you have many breakouts of metering equipment, which just has a short shutdown of, uh, of communication, or maybe there's really um, some serious more problems. So you have to jangle with um, with juggle with different uh, different data gaps on different sites and different moments of different durations. So your system should be able to deal with that. So generate missing data, interpolate data uh, before you even thinking about forecasting optimization. So that was for me. Uh, thank you very much. And I will leave the floor to the next one. Thank you, Christian. There's a. There's a question in the chat asking where the district heating is actually located because I think the presenter missed the location. <laughs> it's in the south of France. It's called La saint sur mer It's near Toulon, so about 45 minutes from Marseille and about one half an hour, one and a half from Nice. Um, so Mediterranean coast, seawater oh. based. Yeah. So visit it in the in the summer, eh? As a to visit the technicalities of it. Yeah. Uh, might, be a, might be a good point here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Christian. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, Giorgio Bonvicini, um, who is a senior energy engineer at RENA and co-chair of the Horizontal Working Group on Districts of the RFC ATIP initiative. He has 11 years of experience in the energy transition and decarbonization field, with a specific focus on excess heat recovery, as well as renewable heating and cooling solutions. So. Giorgio, uh, please uh, click the button to take control. And yeah, uh, if you have any problems, just let me know and I will change the slides for you. If not, the virtual floor and microphone is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dan, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as anticipated by Dan, I will present you the role of heat pumps in the strategic report on renewable heating and cooling developed by the Renewable Heating and Cooling ETIP. Um, the RHC ETIP, so Renewable Heating and Cooling uh, European Technology Innovation Platform, is a project that started last year in September 2022, but uh, with a history dating back to 2008 when uh, the first Renewable Heating and Cooling ETIP was, uh, was uh, started. Uh, this edition of the project will last three years. It uh, has been, is being implemented by a consortium with EUREC, SolarEat Europe, EGEC, Euroheat and Power, EHPA, and WIP Renewable Energies. Uh, as you can see, I am from RINA, but uh, uh, RINA is not a partner of this initiative, but it, this is because the secretariat of the project is composed by these partners, but there is a large number of experts involved from all over Europe, uh, experts in renewable heating and cooling that are contributing to the debates and to the development of the strategic report of the initiative. The mission of the initiative is to provide support and strategic advice to the European Commission, as well as to the government of the EU member state and of the associated countries uh, on the topics of renewable heating and cooling, uh, collecting information and position from uh, several stakeholders, uh, including industrial companies, inclu including research organization, uh, non-government organization, etc. Uh, we have uh, three main, uh, the project has three main pillars uh, of activities. The first, uh, uh, according to a top-down approach. So the first one is more strategic and is related to the increase of the profile and the role of renewable heating and cooling in the process of decarbonization of the EU energy system. And here we are dealing with uh, the development of strategies for the financial sustainability of renewable heating and cooling, the strengthening of co cooperation activities among uh, stakeholders active uh, in renewable heating and cooling at national level. We also are, are working closely with uh, uh, several different uh, um, ETIP uh, working on different topics, so complementary sectors uh, and experts belonging to different sectors. We will see uh, later how the working groups are organized. We are organizing annual conferences for the renewable heating and cooling sector. And later again, I will uh, provide you indication with the uh, upcoming one in May. 
Uh, and uh, we have the task of engaging additional experts from social sciences, sciences and humanities, since at the moment uh, we are mainly technical experts involved. We are many engineers, uh, we have the financial side well represented, but we need to expand in the context of this initiative also the discussion and the stakeholder consultation to social experts. Uh, I have mentioned that this first pillar is related to a more strategic uh, um approach to renewability and cooling then we can go on with the following pillar which is related more to the concrete implementation of projects here our target is to speed up the uptake of renewable heating and cooling technologies uh, supporting the entire industry of renewable heating and cooling with a uh, focus uh, on industrial manufacturing capacity and this is strongly related to the uh, research needs that uh, um, we have identified we are identifying and we are supporting to promote the development, the increase of efficiency, uh, the, uh, the reduction of costs, uh, so uh, the increase of the environmental, economic uh, and uh, uh, energy related sustainability of renewable heating and cooling projects. Uh, with this uh, target, uh, we are uh, uh, drafting uh, strategic reports on priorities, uh, on research priorities. We are carrying out consultation with uh, stakeholders belonging to the different working groups that I will introduce later. And uh, we are uh, consulting also uh, external stakeholders to, to this working group in order to evaluate uh, the current research and industrial trends in renewable heating and cooling and uh, uh, identifying the priorities and providing recommendations. The third pillar of the uh, the initiative is relating to the acceleration of project on the ground to fo in, in the fostering of replication and developing the bankability of the projects. This uh, uh, is implemented through the provision to, to the realization of a renewable heating and cooling accelerator and a one-stop shop for renewable heating and cooling project uh, and to the man maintaining expanding of the online database of renewable heating and cooling project as well as uh, uh, the promotion of renewable heating and cooling technology technology providers on the smart cities marketplace heating and cooling initiative. Uh, this is related to the need that we always identify on, on research project uh, on uh, renewable heating and cooling to promote these technologies to develop knowledge not only for technicians, for technical experts that need to design and to implement this kind of project, but also for investors who need to uh, support the realization of this project with their funds. Um, Okay, so how are we organized in this initiative? As you can see, we have a top level uh, where we have stakeholders, which are the main uh, input of the information we need uh, for, uh, for realizing our work. We have the secretariat composed by the organization that I have mentioned in my first slide. We have the board with one representative for each uh, organization and from each uh, technology panel and working group that you can see at the bottom. And then we have uh, a matrix-based uh, uh, structure where you can see in the vertical columns the technology panels. So the technology panel on solar thermal, the one on biomass, the one on geothermal, the one on heat pumps, uh, and the one on district heating and cooling and thermal storage. Uh, in order to facilitate the cooperation about uh, these uh, technology panels, uh, we also have set up uh, horizontal working groups. Uh, horizontal working groups uh, are related to the vision, so a more strategic coordination of the pl energy planning uh, with reference to renewable heating and cooling. One more related to cities, one more related to districts, uh, one to buildings and one to industries. Specifically, I am contributing as co-chair, the chair is Sabine Putz from Sol uh, in Austria, uh, to the uh, horizontal working group on districts where we are focusing our, our activities on uh, uh, district heating and cooling solutions uh, in order to integrate as much as possible the um, renewable heating and cooling sources. 
Uh, we are also cooperating uh, as horizontal working groups with uh, relevant uh, ETIP. So, as I mentioned, our role is to, uh, in, in my case, specifically for districts, is to coordinate with uh, experts from different technologies, so from solar, biomass, geothermal, etc., heat pumps, etc., uh, to put together some strategies and identify some trends and provide some recommendations that are related to uh, the technologies and the solution that have a potential for the energy transition of districts. And here uh, you can see some of the initiative we are cooperating with, uh, for example, uh, the other ETIP for bioenergy, for deep geothermal, for uh, solar thermal, etc. We are potentially collaborating also with the new European Bauhaus initiative and the mission on 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. Uh, and uh, is uh, every year I would say we are contributing with uh, uh, paragraphs uh, to the strategic reports developed by the uh, Renewable Heating and Cooling uh, ETIP. Uh, the uh, strategic reports I am referring to are, uh, for example, the ones you can see here in this slide and that you can uh, download from the link I have put in the slide. So I am referring to the 2050 vision for 100% renewable heating and cooling in Europe, to the strategic research and innovation agenda for climate neutral heating and cooling in Europe, and to the strategic report on implementation, research and innovation priorities uh, and deployment trends on the renewable heating and cooling technologies. Specifically, in this presentation, I am referring to the uh, last one I have mentioned, which is the strategic report on research trends in renewable heating and cooling, and since I am particularly involved, as I have mentioned, in the um, horizontal working group on districts, uh, I am presenting the uh, main outcomes related to, to districts. Uh, as I have mentioned, uh, we uh, have built the, um, a, the strategic report uh, on our knowledge as technical experts, as many technical experts involved, but also on a stakeholder consultation that we have carried out. And in this slide, you can see the number of experts, of companies, uh, of institutions that we have consulted and uh, a breakdown of their uh, uh, geographical distribution and their technology uh, field. Uh, as you can see, we have many, we had many answers from Germany, from Italy, Spain, Austria, but also uh, almost all other European countries are represented. Uh, regarding technologies, we have, we had the stakeholders uh, um, from the solar thermal, from the heating and cooling, from thermal storage, from heat pumps sector, but also other uh, renewable heating and cooling technologies uh, were well represented in the um, in the stakeholder consultation. So going <laughs> back to this slide on, uh, on the main results of the consultation and of the strategic report with focus on districts, uh, we have identified, I can say, we have identified three main priorities with reference to the energy transition of districts. One related to energy system integration at district level, one to the reduction of distribution temperature in heat networks at district level, and one to the decarbonization scenario evaluation and strategies at the district level. All of these uh, uh, priorities are strongly related to heat pumps. Now, I have three slides, one for each of these priorities, where we can see the real, the, the, the presence of heat pumps in all of these priorities. So, regarding energy system integration at district level, we have identified, for example, as priorities in the research innovation trends at European level, uh, the use of solar energy, the use uh, of uh, uh, excess heat both from industry and from non-industrial urban sources that were already mentioned also in the rewarded project and will be uh, mentioned also by Christina later in the Reuse It project. I, I have both contributed to both of these projects as uh, Rina. Uh, and uh, we have identified uh, the need also to recover waste cold. 
Uh, all of these topics, as you can see, these are these are extracts from the strategic report I have mentioned, uh, uh, include the word heat pumps, because uh, both for the recovery of low temperature excess heat from industrial and uh, urban sources, both for the increase of the level of temperature of heat produced uh, from solar, not uh, from all technologies, but uh, for many of the technologies we are using, uh, and also for the, recover, uh, the recovery of waste cold, uh, the use of heat pumps is, uh, is required or at least in any case it's useful. Then the second priority I have mentioned is related to the reduction of the distribution temperature in district heating and cooling networks. Uh, so here the trends we have identified are related to the integration of heat pumps uh, in district heating and cooling systems. So uh, both for the integration of the uh, sources I have mentioned in my previous slides and also for the realization of very low uh, or neutral temperature uh, district heating networks uh, with uh, uh, decentralized heat pumps at building level, for example. Um, then the third priority I have mentioned is related to the decarbonization strategies at district level. And in this case, uh, again, heat pumps are mentioned because we are targeting, uh, of course, the increase of the penetration of renewable heating and cooling in, uh, in districts. And to this aim, the exploitation of a renewable and sustainable recovered heat sources that I have mentioned in the previous slides is very important and can be achieved through the use of heat pumps. Then another important topic we have identified for the realization of the decarbonization strategies at district level is related to the mapping of uh, uh, the heat demand, the heating and cooling demands on one side, and uh, of the heating and cooling sources available on the other side, uh, which can be done uh, through different tools that are available. Many tools are being developed also in uh, the European uh, co-funded project we are contributing to, uh, and the approaches uh, uh, that are most common in this field are those related to energy communities and to positive energy districts. Uh, emerging trends in the decarbonization strategies that are being prepared at district level are related to hydrogen, 100% uh, hydrogen boilers and burners, as well as to the analysis in life cycle terms of the environmental impact associated to different technologies, which is also very interesting to see how, uh, for example, the realization of the, the equipment, uh, the operation and maintenance uh, uh, impact on the production of the kilowatt hour of thermal energy provided by different uh, sources. Then, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, we are in this strategic report, we are identifying the current trends uh, and we are uh, identifying uh, some recommendations in order to foster the development of renewable heating and cooling. And to this aim, uh, I have the last uh, three slides of my presentation, which uh, uh, collect some outcomes from the strategic report. Uh, regarding uh, renewable heating and cooling in district. Uh, for example, stakeholders highlighted the need for energy efficiency, sustainability and circularity, which is uh, a cross-cutting topic uh, on uh, energy and is also applicable, of course, to heating and cooling sector. At district level, uh, renew renewable heating and cooling planning is essential. And uh, uh, as I was mentioning, in order to match uh, the local heat demand and uh, um, the potential supply of renewable and sustainable sources, the use of heat pumps is really important, and also to match the, the different level of temperature that are uh, required uh, for, uh, by, by buildings. Uh, of course, uh, the correct approach for the realization of this kind of project starts from uh, a deep renovation of existing buildings in order to make them suitable for low temperature uh, heating. Um, then uh, the conversion of the existing uh, heating and cooling systems uh, to integrate as much as possible uh, renewable heating and cooling sources. 
Then in the second slide, we uh, see some recommendations related to the support required for the implementation of renewable heating and cooling project in districts. Uh, of course, the support is required for this kind of project support uh, that needs to come from uh, local authorities that must be the drivers of this kind of, uh, of solutions uh, and from governments that need to regulate the sector of district heating and to make easy, easier the realization of this kind of projects. Of course, the support of government and of the European Commission to research project in this field is also important, as I was mentioning, not only to demonstrate the technical feasibility of this solution, but also to generate the knowledge for the general public, both citizens, local institutions, financial players, etc., that need to be aware of this solution in order to decide to support them because they have a great potential in decarbonization. Um, then uh, support from investors is required for the conversion of existing district heating and cooling system to work to a low temperature or uh, <clears throat> Uh, to the re for the realization of new district heating and cooling systems uh, in areas that are currently not provided with uh, uh, these kind of systems and um, of course, the legislative and normative framework needs to be um, a facilitation <laughs> needs to facilitate the realization of this kind of uh, uh, of solutions and uh, um, to abate the barriers related to the permitting that in some countries, especially, are really uh, relevant. Last slide. Uh, Another recommendation coming from the strategic report, data availability. In order to properly evaluate, plan the realization of this heating and cooling investment based on renewable sources and sustainable sources in general, like waste heat recovery, uh, a large data, uh, a large amount of data is required, especially related to uh, heating demand, uh, to availability of sources, uh, to features of technologies, uh, and therefore it is important to develop develop uh, tools, IT tools that are able to map this kind of uh, demands and supply, uh, relying on existing databases that need to be developed at local and national level, and uh, to uh, prepare open source model libraries, uh, open innovation practices, etc. Uh, that uh, can be useful to model uh, the devices uh, required to couple the demand and the supply of energy. And to conclude, uh, continuous involvement of stakeholders is required uh, in order, again, to create knowledge on this topic. Uh, last slide, uh, just to remind you, as I have uh, mentioned in the presentation of the Renewable Heating and Cooling ETIP initiative. Every year we organize a conference. This year the conference will be in Torino on May 25th in the context of the Euro Heat and Power Congress. Uh, here you can see in this slide the link for registration in case you are interested to, to attend. Uh, thank you very much for your participation, for your attention, and I am available for any question. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio. I think there's a question in the chat, by the way, um, and I highly recommend taking a look at the RHC website. You can find there all the resources that Giorgio has talked about and also taking a look into advantages of being a member of the platform. Membership is free and basically if you are engaged, your voice can actually be translated into those specific documents and some of them um, have a real, real value for the future in the sense that, for example, some of them will be used to um, design new EU-funded calls for projects. Just an example. So have a look. The link is in the chat, or if not, just Google RHC ETIP and see the work that is being done there. Uh, also take a look at the, at the event in Turin, of course. So thank you, Giorgio, again. And... Uh, Lastly, our last speaker for uh, for today is Christina Lignerud. Uh, Christina has worked with district heating issues since 2004. 
Her PhD was on the topic of risk management, a topic that she has pursued in different ways since, as risk manager in a municipal district energy company, but also as a researcher focusing on the management of risk and business models for waste heat recovery. She has coordinated the EU project Reuse Heat on low temperature heat recovery and is the chair of the European Knowledge Hub on District Heating and Cooling, or DHC+. Since 2002, she's also a professor at the University of Lund. So many, many things to juggle, Christina. Um, you can press the button to take control. It's on the top ribbon. Yeah, if you have any issues, please let me know and I can change the slides for you. Uh, thank you for being here and the virtual floor and microphone is yours. Thank you, Dan. Very nice to be here. So very nice introduction also. I will talk today about findings from the Reuse Heat project. And uh, I really like today that we talked so much about recovering waste heat because even the title of the project was Recovering Urban Waste Heat, Reuse Heat. And this was a, a, an EU project, Horizon 2020. It started in 2017 and just ended last year. And we have been focusing on low temperature waste heat sources. And here I will focus today on the link between that kind of heat source and uh, heat pumps. So I will begin by introducing the project slightly, uh, talk about the potential of urban waste heat that is out there. It's really big. Uh, talking a little bit about some of our demonstrators, learnings from our replication sites and conclude. So this picture that you see, it was the vision of the Reuse Heat project that in the future cities should make use of the waste heat that they generate uh, on a daily basis. So you have infrastructure like metro systems, you have sewage water, you have data centers and there are buildings also emitting a lot of energy. So all these things were in focus in the project and it was nine countries uh, 16 partners and a budget of 5 million euro. And in this picture, you don't see a, a very important demonstrator that we also had because it was a non-technical demonstrator. It was an awareness creating demonstrator. Uh, and it was actually featuring the system mentioned by Christian Kame earlier uh, in the south of France, um, where we built um, a dashboard to visualize that this kind of heat is out there and you can make use of it. In terms of how much is available out there, so the heat demand for heating and buildings, um, cooling and hot water in Europe is about 10 eta joule per year. And our heat sources uh, that we looked into would be uh, about 10% of this pie could be met by the urban heat sources. And in the smaller pie to the right, you can see that the biggest uh, urban heat source that we have identified is from sewage water. Then you have from data centers, different kinds of buildings, smaller fractions from food um, processes and a very small fraction from metro systems. And it's interesting because these heat sources have different characteristics. Uh, for example, the sewage water is very stable. It's there across the year at a constant temperature, whereas other can fluctuate more. I will focus today on two of our demonstrators that were technical. So one was data center heat recovery and one was hospital heat recovery, where we recovered waste heat from a cooling tower. The data centers, the data centers center is located in Braunschweig, Germany, and it's the local energy company, BS Energy, that has performed the installation. And what we did was to um, recover the heat source from the data center at 25 degrees and then use a booster heat pump to raise it to 70 degrees. And we had to raise it there because of Legionella. And this waste heat was used to provide uh, heat and hot water to new buildings. It was a um, combination of building types, so residential buildings, but also a shopping mall and some office, office space. 
And um, for the energy company, this was uh, an efficient thing to do to make this low temperature grid instead of expanding their uh, combustion capacity. And in the other part of the network, the big network, uh, the, the older network, it's about 100 years this year, uh, they are burning gas. So they didn't want to expand the use of gas. Uh, but we have this link between the old system and the new system in case there would be some kind of failure of delivery of data center waste heat. And this installation actually won a global award in 2019. So what did we learn that is relevant to the heat pump society? So Legionella makes it necessary to use some kind of boosting heat pump. So that's an opportunity for heat pumps. And um, when we started the project in 2017, it was very difficult to find them with natural refrigerants. Um, but I think this has improved ever since. We just used a small fraction of the waste available in the data center, so we could have made a larger installation, but we didn't need more for the, the building area. Uh, we found out that data centers have different priorities than uh, waste heat recovery, so it's difficult to find the time to talk to them, so you can on both sides understand what volumes are coming in, when are they coming in, what kind of contract should we have. Uh, and also we realized that they scale up their activity gradually. So even though you have a building of a data center there, it doesn't mean that you have full heat volumes from the beginning. So you have to have some patience. And we also realized uh, that what is built in uh, the user side will also largely impact the efficiency of your system. So for example, we were assuming that they would have a flow through system um, but instead they installed tanks and that uh, caused some overheating issues and bypasses on our side. So keep an eye on the full process. In terms of results, um, I'll just point to the primary energy saved. So when we had a, a full load, it was uh, something like 2,600 megawatts per year, also saving a lot of CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, a payback around three years. That was the first one. Then we go to the hospital heat recovery. So before the installation of the reuse heat demonstrator, um, it was mainly operating on gas, uh, heating and cooling processes, and also um, providing process water for different things in the hospital. Here we took waste heat from cooling towers at around 25-35 degrees and raised it up to 50-55 degrees with a heat pump. Um, this was a, a micro system, you can say, uh, of seven large buildings uh, around the hospital with about 61,000 square meters and uh, a lot of patients coming through every year, about 200,000. It was one of the biggest hospitals in Madrid. But the main thing here was to phase out gas, because uh, in Spain, um, hospitals have a lot of pressure. It's a public building. They have to become greener sooner um, and um, they have to do a lot of action. And this was seen as a, a very interesting action. So what did we learn here then uh, for the heat pump installation? So it's very tricky to write contracts with public entities everywhere, also in Spain. But here, in our case, we had the advantage of um, having a long term contract in place because our partner was an ESCO, um, uh, a CIME in the GEE group, and um, they were in um, a long term contract to provide win win solutions for both sides, which made this easier. We also found out that this kind of large and old building has a lot of particularities. Uh, many people have been in over time working on different parts of the energy system. So you really need somebody who can find uh, their way around the system to do the fittings and installations needed. When we included this kind of new heat source, we needed to improve our control system, the digital structure, so we could use the source uh, efficiently at all times. 
Um, and thinking about this one, we have seen that there are cooling towers in many places, especially in warm countries. And the ESCO is also operating in Southern America uh, in this particular case. So we see that there is a very big potential from heat recovery in um, cooling towers. Uh, and um, the, um, the ESCO was interested in finding out if our installation could be improved even further. So they made a, an installation in parallel to the reuse heat project, but it was outside of the project in terms of financing. And it was to install um, so solar on the rooftops of the hospital. And that uh, electricity then could run the, the pump, uh, which turned out to be very favorable. So here again, we see that we saved substantial amount of um, um, primary energy, something like 3,800 megawatts per year, um, large carbon emission savings, and a payback of lower than two years. Uh, I will just briefly mention the third technical demonstrator that we were foreseeing to make. It was to make metro system heat recovery from metro tunnels. We made two concepts for two different locations, but none of them were implemented for different reasons. There was a pandemic, costs became higher, and also the metro operator decided to uh, make a reconstruction in the first foreseen site, so we were also delayed. But um, just summarizing, the first location was in Ernst Reuter Platz, and there we would have the user being the technical university, and they would heat up the restaurant of the, the university, and it was very close by. And we would just take the heat source from the station through an adjacent room, which you actually see here in the picture, and then it was, was not very far away to the university, so this was a good solution. And then we had to shift this location because the metro was going to build a staircase instead of this room there. And this was not really communicated to us. And we couldn't wait for the staircase to be done because EU projects have a timeline. Uh, so we shifted to another location, which was Frankfurter Allee. And there we were going to replace direct electricity for the metro building itself, a rather big building. And they were linked together, a microgrid again. Um, but we could not make it because the, the heat source and the heat using user were too far apart. So it really eroded the business case also that we had to make a transfer of about 100 meter. But we have at least got the concepts. Uh, there is one metro heat installation that is recovering heat from the ventilation shaft uh, that has been done with EU funding, and it's the one in Islington Station in London. So we are actually now transferring our learnings together with them, and we try to make a paper together with Madrid Subterra in Spain, who are very interested in doing this kind of um, joint collaboration. So maybe there will be an installation in Spain soon. So what did we learn about heat pumps and metro heat recovery? Well, we saw that there was a lot of metal dust in the air and we had to somehow make sure it would not um, damage the operation of the heat pump. So we were thinking we would coat it. Uh, and then it's very difficult to both install the heat pump and maintain it in this kind of environment because um, safety regulations are very, very strong in metro tunnels. Then, as I already said, that the distance between the heat source and the heat use was uh, a weak point in our solution. Uh, and we conclude that the best point in time to make this kind of installation is when you make a new platform or you make a deep renovation of a platform. It's rather difficult to fit it in when things are ongoing. We also made a number of replication sites and we can conclude a little bit from them also. We made a replication of groundwater heat recovery in London, data center heat recovery in Vilnius, uh, absorption shiller in a uh, hospital in Genova, metro tunnel uh, and station uh, in Belgrade and a supermarket in Vilnius. And on the heat pump side, we saw in our installed sites and in the replication sites that the temperature and how variable the heat sources are um, impacts how efficient the installation will be and how much electricity you will have. So one of the main conclusions is that always take 
care and time to study the heat source. So you know what you have um, to work with. Uh, and then what they did in the hospital in Madrid, we also um, simulated it for our um, replication sites. And it seems very good to install also in some kind of PV to operate the pumps with electricity from them when you do this kind of installation. Then you don't have the extra risk of electricity price changing. And uh, you will always need to make different kinds of um, actions to install this kind of uh, solution in the existing infrastructure. It can be mechanical, control, hydraulic, electric. We needed to make bypasses in both the data center and the hospital, for example, because the systems were not having enough water for cooling and, and these kind of things. So you need to make some um, adjustments. Main conclusions then. So urban waste heat recovery can be done. You don't need to go out and make some new technical innovation. Heat pumps, as you know, have been around for a while. It's just a matter of putting them into a system with waste heat sources. And we have demonstrated paybacks of two to three years, which I think are very appetizing. And why is it not happening? Well, as we saw, we have low awareness across the value chain heat users, those who build buildings, policymakers, investors, and if there is low awareness, there is no demand, right? So it's a negative spiral. And previously, the cost of carbon has been too low, which means that this kind of future solution where you don't need any combustion has been um, seen as not cost competitive compared to, for example, gas. And by that, I thank you for listening. And if you want to read about the details of this, you find uh, you find the information in our handbook on the project website. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have taken back control of the slides. Um, I will invite the speakers to turn their cameras on um, for just some questions. I, now, I know there were some questions in the chat and I think they, they all have been answered. Um, but taking some notes during the presentation, I would just go back to, to Christina and, and ask her about the inclusion of heat pumps. Uh, now, I know you had the conclusion slide just now, uh, but it seems that at least now, including heat pumps in the fuel supply of district heating companies appears to be uh, profitable and good for the environment, given that also they can get the money back for the investment quite easily. So um, you also said some of the factors. Are there any factors why the inclusion of heat pumps in the district heating is not so common from your uh, research during the project? Yeah, so I think um, some are very much linked to uh, the way that people think. So there is a tradition in district heating to combust something, right? But this kind of heat source does not necessitate need to be combusted. So there is a, a shift in, in your logic and also in the business model. And in our cases, we see that often you think technology implementation first and not business model development. And if you don't do the two at the same time, well, then you will erode at least on paper the value you can have of this kind of installation. But I'm really hopeful now when we have this re really big push to phase out gas that it will come more and more. And also waste heat being a hot topic, I hope it will come more and more. So we just have to create awareness, right, Christian, with our dashboard. Uh, showing the world it can be done. Inform citizens, yes. Indeed, there's there are many opportunities now, and now is basically the golden age of making people um, at at least aware of the of the the things that can be changed. I'm pretty sure they're getting aware by you know the especially last year when the prices of gas seemed to be going up and up. And there was also the, the possibility of the gas being shut off completely. But to go back to our discussion and uh, to go to Christian, um, what is the forecast accuracy of the tool that you have presented? And I wonder, because we, we talked about this as well, and we're all aware, did the COVID situation influence your forecasts, for example, or how, how did COVID come into the equation of your work? 
Well, um, it's quite of a challenge. Um, our currency focus accuracy is quite well. We made a benchmark on operating system centralized ones. Um, we have really good fo uh, forecast about two to five percent deviation. Uh, whereas in the case of La Saint-Sur-Mer, we are more about between uh, five and fifteen percent deviation, depending on the substations. So it's quite acceptable yet. Uh, nevertheless, indeed, the struggle with COVID was big because. Um, this, let's say, not model based type of focus, so um, based on learning algorithms, historical data, we need about one to two years um, data series long back in the back in the past. So indeed, we come totally into the COVID situation where we have completely different energy behavior of what we can um, see today. So actually, we have to wait to operate under normal conditions in order to have enough data to be able to, to train the forecast system properly. So COVID uh, really retarded our work. <laughs> so um, we don't find uh, this, the, the behavior during the situation was completely different in both residential and commercial buildings. So really have no, um, uh, I would al al almost say the data almost useless. <laughs> and what happens, for example, if um, you have data gaps in your data gathering, for example, if a piece piece of equipment is malfunction malfunctioning or have, not behaving optimally, we have that almost every week. So we have, um, in the case of the sensor mer we're on a 4G uh, uh, type of connection, so not a LAN connection. So it's quite common that you have some uh, substation where we're located underground or let's say in less accessible situations. Uh, we have some temporal shutdowns of loss of losing communication. So we had to implement into the net into the system um, the fact that in the real extreme cases we won't be able to forecast. So it will be the SCADA system that will work as usual and take the hand on the on the system. And in the less extreme situation where we have about two, three to four time step missing, uh, we provided uh, algorithm for interpolating the data and uh, searching the data and the historic data to replace this data uh, which are missing. So um, we have to work with this. It's a uh, daily business. It's daily, it happens every week, almost daily, that you have one or two data points missing, which are important and indeed we substitute it. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, going to Roberto, um, what features should a heat pump include to fit, to fit the most optimally possible in the district heating and cooling network applications? And I'm sure you did a lot of research into this. Yeah, this fits also with a question that I've seen in the in the chat. Um, basically, the the heat pumps that we are using in the different applications are are conventional uh, water to water heat pumps with conventional refrigerants, uh, for example, R four four ten C or or one three four A. Um, so really conventional units, um, for example, in the in the high temperature application that I've shown in my <clears throat> in my slides, we have uh, we are using heat pumps with two compressors, no 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 compressor speed control at all, so on off, which is again they are really um, basic uh, heat pumps. The sector is moving really fast in developing new new features, uh, mainly in the air to water, uh, in the air to water applications, with the new uh, low GWP uh, refrigerants like uh, propane, and with uh, compressor speed controls, allowing access to third parties um, um, via um, communication uh, ports. Uh, in order for again aggregators and utilities to to be able uh, controlling uh, the heat pump in a in a way which is suitable for the for the grids and for maximizing or optimizing the uh, the efficiency. This is something that we need also in the in this sector, meaning that we should um, we should uh, yeah we should profit of heat pumps of units. That are uh, um, allowing to <clears throat> uh, to exploit the the flexibility which is uh, possible in these uh, heating and cooling networks, uh, meaning that we should uh, uh, <clears throat> have available heat pumps that allow to 
enter uh, how to supply water to the evaporator uh, from 15 to up to 50, 60 degrees, 5060 degrees C, uh, with again uh, flexibility in how the compressor is used. Um, because this allows to, to optimize covering the, the thermal loads in a proper way. It is not yet possible or not yet available commercially, um, but still um, we hope that this, um, this will be possible in the future, in the near future, because this would really help improve in the, the efficiency of these substations and the control of the overall uh, district heating um, yeah, as a whole. Thank you so much. And then for the last question is for Giorgio. And I think there was there were some questions in the chat as well. Um, it's given the work that the REC ETIP is doing, its own work and the collaboration with other ETIPs, uh, given the members of the secretariat of this initiative, um, what heating and cooling technologies do you foresee as having the largest potential to decarbonize the EU energy system uh, on a short term and medium to long term as well, of course? Thank you for your question, Dan. Uh, at uh, engineering courses, they, all, they always recommend the answering it depends. So I start uh, answering it depends. It depends a lot also on, uh, on the location we are, uh, we are considering. Of course, uh, as I was mentioning during my presentation, uh, um, matching uh, the heating and cooling demand with uh, uh, the availability of sources for renewable heating and cooling is the best uh, the, the first principle in energy planning at district at city level and indeed uh, um, we have uh, talked about a lot of technologies during today's presentation and uh, depending on the specific uh, uh, location we, we can have availability of a specific source to be exploited like for example seawater like uh, solar thermal uh, like uh, uh, metro stations sewage data centers etc mm, so besides the uh, exploitation of a specific source uh, for the production of heating and cooling, I believe district, district heating and cooling solutions are really the uh, infrastructure that can contribute to the uh, decarbonization of the heating and cooling sector. And uh, um, of course, coupled with the storage, thermal storage systems and with the, a renewable electricity production systems in order to feed the heat pumps uh, that are involved in the district and cooling system, both as uh, individual building heat pumps in case we are realizing a neutral temperature district and cooling network, or centralized heat pumps in case we are recovering a specific source of heat and feeding into a, a, a more conventional high, higher temperature network. Thank you so much, Giorgio. And I would like to also thank the, all the speakers, including Josephine that is no longer here, but I will thank her personally as we're colleagues. Um, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time. Thank you for answering the questions and for your presentations. And with that being said, we are moving towards the end of the event. Um, if you have found this information useful and would like to follow more the work that is being done as part of the Reward Heat project, uh, you have now on the screen uh, the, um, the way that you can find this information out. Of course, Googling Reward Heat would probably work as well. Um, if you like this event or and want to participate in more of them, uh, at EHP, we have quite a lot of events that are going on all the time. Uh, you can find them out on our social media or on our website. Uh, feel free to check them out. They're all, well, some are on site, and but more, most of them are, are um, online like this one now. And if you miss them, you can just see the, the recording on YouTube. Lastly, thank you again for being here. Um, I wish you all the um, a good rest of the day and thank you for my colleagues that uh, also helped a lot in organizing this event. Thank you so much. Have a nice rest of the day.